26th Annual Public Lecture Series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf Institute's Executive Director, and we're joining you today from the traditional homelands of the Narragansett and Niantic Nations. Their lands and waters originally encompassed what is now the state of Rhode Island into Eastern Connecticut and Southern Massachusetts. And we want to honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the Narragansett and Niantic peoples and these lands by teaching and learning more about their history and their present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land we too inhabit. That stewardship is central to uh, the topics that we discuss in this lecture series. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed and inclusive public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We achieve this through science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the world to make all types of science communication more inclusive and equitable. This year's lecture series explores the opportunities and challenges of creating an equitable transition to clean energy. Climate change is well underway. We can see this every day around the world. The hazy skies and poor air quality we're experiencing in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic this week from wildfires in Canada, events that folks on the West Coast and elsewhere in the world have experienced for years, is yet another reminder of the fact that we're living in a new normal. As climate scientists have warned for decades, the effects of climate change can't be immediately stopped. The good news is that we can at least limit the worst effects by shifting our energy systems away from fossil fuels, the, the fuels that produce greenhouse gases, and moving quickly toward a zero emissions future. Over this month, Metcalf Institute's public lecture series will introduce you to some of the issues related to this massive shift in how we harness and distribute energy in ways that are equitable, environmentally responsible, and economically viable. We thank all of you for being here today to begin exploring this critical topic with us. I also want to note that thanks to several generous donors, Metcalf Institute has a dollar for dollar matching opportunity this month until June 30th for all donations up to $12,500. Your gifts support public programs like this one, as well as professional development for journalists and scientists, all in the interest of advancing conversations that increase awareness and action on the urgent challenges posed by climate change and environmental inequities. If you would like your gift automatically doubled, please click on the link that is now in the chat. And now to today's lecture. The clean energy trans transition requires thoughtful planning at a massive scale, from local zoning to federal policy. In order to ensure a just transition, we need to center equitable approaches in all of these planning efforts. Today, we will focus on some of the planning considerations in the context of how new technologies are rolled out and in how decision makers develop their urban infrastructure planning. Dr. Castellanos Rodriguez will describe local and international partnerships with government stakeholders and the private sector that have helped develop indicators to prioritize equitable interventions in the transportation sector. He will conclude with highlights of his lab's ongoing work on equitable energy transitions. Dr. Castellanos is an assistant professor at the University of Texas Austin's Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering Department where he leads the Rapid Equitable and Sustainable Transitions or RESET lab, analyzing just decarbonization pathways for emerging economies, data-driven sustainable transportation approaches and equitable local energy transitions. With collaborators, his interdisciplinary projects have been awarded international prizes, such as the United Nations Data for Climate Action Challenge, they have won national competitions in Mexico, for example, and gathered media attention through Forbes and Green Tech Media. 
Prior to working at University of Texas, Dr. Castellanos was a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley's, uh, at Berkeley, excuse me, leading binational US and Mexico projects and helping to bridge the clean energy technology gap between these two countries. Dr. Castellanos holds an engineering PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'm also thrilled to note that he is a current fellow in the SciComm Identities Project, a joint project between Metcalf Institute and Michigan State University's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism that aims to prepare pre-tenure faculty of color to be effective science communicators throughout their careers. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Castellanos to tell us more about how thoughtful partnerships can yield equitable advances in clean energy infrastructure. Dr. Castellanos. Thank you so much for this kind of introduction, Sunshine. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. So as uh, Professor Sunshine mentioned, I'm Sergio Castellanos and I'm a proud SCIP fellow, first and foremost. Um, and I'm also an assistant professor here at UT Austin, uh, Civil Architecture and Environmental Engineering, where I'm leading the Reset Lab, as it was just stated. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about transportation electrification, some of the benefits, the challenges, and the opportunities to avoid inequities from the perspective of the work that we've done and are currently doing here in our lab. As a first order, I'd like to give my students at the Reset Lab a shout out because uh, they're really uh, enthusiastic and extremely passionate students that deeply care about how the technology impacts society and also about what we can do to mitigate any disparity that might arise from that. So when we select the topics that we focus on, this Sankey diagram that you see on the screen gives a good understanding of the motivation. This represents an inventory of global greenhouse gas emissions. So on the left hand, left hand side, you see the different sectors that tie to the right hand side uh, to different greenhouse gases. And the main driver in this case corresponds to energy. Now, within that, we see that the main contributors are electricity and heat. And the second largest, in this case, globally, is transportation. Hence, the work that we do in our lab centers around these two sectors primarily. Interestingly, um, in the US, transportation sector is the economic sector that emits the highest share of CO2 emissions placing it at a 35% share compared to other sectors, say electricity, which is at 31%. And so recognizing this pressing challenge, agencies at a local, state, and federal level are placing their biggest efforts to revamp this sector and decarbonizing it. So one way to think about the decarbonization process is through electrification. And so there's no uh, clearer way to show that than through this example of actions that are taking place. So this is an announcement from just a couple of weeks ago where there was yet one of others that have been coming throughout this uh, couple of years from the Department of Energy in which they state and they're committing to funnel hundreds of millions of dollars to this very important task. So for today's discussion, I would like to talk about transportation electrification across different segments, the benefits, the impacts to the grid, the infrastructure deployment, public transportation as well, and then move a bit beyond that. All of these segments are presented through the lens of the work that we do in our lab, and we would like to reflect on some of the potential opportunities to avoid inequities. Now, to be upfront, Nothing here is exhaustive, and there's always much more happening in the sector and also in the research space, as well as the opportunities to address social justice. So consider this a humble contribution to spark some discussions. So to start off, um, let's uh, begin with the question of why transportation electrification. So one of the big benefits of transportation electrification comes through cleaner uh, air or cleaner or bigger, improved air quality. So the question in hand here is how much better 
can our air be with an electrified transportation sector? So to answer this question, we have engaged with international in an international data-driven partnership, in this case with the United Nations, with Waze, uh, which is a company from Google, and also government institutions. And so what we have done is starting to collect data from Waze at a, a minute level interval. Uh, we extract different driving patterns out of this and use that as an information to fit it into the into a mobile emission source model. So we can understand what are the implications and impacts of transportation and air quality, especially if we start thinking about different policies that would constitute the electrification piece. So with aims at informing public policy, this effort is slightly different than other approaches in the sense that others might have had limited street segments or uh, not using real data to understand the impacts, basically neglecting some of the uh, subtle driving patterns from the different sectors of the city, or might have been lacking the connection with policy assessment, in this case, electromobility or transportation electrification. So what we do here, we're using a very large data set um, from, as I mentioned, on a mid-level interval from Waze. We use this to couple with transportation and with the aims in this partnership, specifically with the agency that I mentioned in Mexico, is basically to provide a, a more accurate assessments for the transportation sector and the potential to remove or reduce uh, emissions in their INDCs or their intended national determined contributions. So what you see here is an image on the left-hand side from the greater Mexico city region, which is a is huge test bed. In this case, it's more than 20 million people driving and living in there, and also a significant portion of them driving. And what you see is a color gradient that goes from light blue to dark red, which just constitute the type of traffic congestion that are happening across the city. And so in this case, this is not an imported file, that, come, that draws the map, but rather just selecting all the different segments and their traffic, we can paint out essentially the entire city. We can also uncover different patterns. We can see them spatial resolve, understanding where traffic is coming from and where to and at what times of the day. So what you see here is just the orientation of the morning traffic with the arrows pointing in different directions, also shown here in angles on the right-hand side, and then showing the traffic in the evening and in this example, how it's driving out of the city center. Beyond the spatial component, we can also understand the time domain. And so in this case, this gives us a good idea across different sections of segments of the city when traffic is happening. Um, the important piece in this uh, consideration as well is to understand what type of policies can be implemented and what are the implications mostly in reducing air pollutants that could then lead to a healthier lifestyle. And so we take, in this case, PM 2.5, which is uh, air polluting particles that have the diameters of less than 2.5 microns and that are associated with poor respiratory and cardiac health outcomes. And so when modeling the impact of electrification, we design different scenarios that policymakers could consider. For example, what would happen if you start electrifying all the taxi, uh, cap, the taxi cap fleet in Mexico City in this case? So what we see is in general, you would see a 3.5 or a 3% reduction in PM 2.5. You can start increasing the level of ambition and think about, okay, what would happen if we electrify the public transportation sector? So all the buses in uh, this megalopolis, and that would lead to about 25% reduction in PN2.5. And of course, you know, for those who have uh, personal owned vehicles, what would happen if you electrify that as well? And so what we see is there's almost a 50% reduction in PM 2.5, which would be huge and highly significant. So now we can start seeing, you know, from the, um, cell phone level data, we can start bringing this to the entire city across time, across space, and understand what are the benefits, but more importantly, quantifying those. And so a, a couple of learnings, uh, or a, a learning from this effort is that transportation emissions, as you saw on these maps behind, can be highly localized, down to the street level, of course. And when we're trying to clean our air, urban and road planning, they both come together and so designing crafty pol crafting policies in there around 
uh, highly spatial and temporal policies would be quite helpful. Um, especially we're trying to think about inequities that might stem, uh, stem from this. You know, it's important to highlight that a holistic planning process is required, um, but also, you know, giving solutions. If there is a sign that some streets are uh, having higher pollution, and we understand that those are in environmental burden census tracts, uh, we can start thinking about spatial sensitive policies, restricting traffic flow, for example, at given points in time, so both geography or spatial resolve or time resolve, to start cleaning some of those corridors in the city. So I think it gives us a potential to address these issues that are right now happening and could be continuing to happen in the future. So moving on, a common question that is currently explored is, okay, we're deploying EVs, but we're seeing that you know more electricity will be consumed through these EVs and our power grids are quite fragile already. So how should we plan ahead for the future if more EVs are coming to connect to the grid? And so it's important to take a look at that because EVs not, not only can improve the air quality, but also impact directly you know, the way we interact with the grid. And so this impact is highly dependent on different variables. For example, what is the composition of the grid? Uh, how much renewables you have or base load non-renewable fossil fuels, fossil fuel based generation, but also how you're charging, you know, the time of day. Are you charging immediately? Are you charging once you get from home? Are you planning that in a managed way? So all of these things may impact the grid as well uh, and the planning into the future. So there are more variables that come into play. And for example, depending if we're thinking right now, it's 2023, how might that look in 2040, 2050? Well, we have to have a good understanding of the expected population growth, how many uh, EVs per household will there be? How will they be charging? Where will they charge? Is it gonna be at, at, their, at their home, at their office, at the park, public space, a mall, you name it. Uh, is it gonna be a day, at night, a combination? based on some market signal. So this just opens a uh, bread of opportunities, this of challenges, but also of opportunities. So we're trying to think about that because at the end of the day, this will have an impact in how the grid is planned and how the emissions might be coming from the grid as well. And to do that, you know, we're thinking, okay, let's evaluate different scenarios. One is if we start charging unmanaged in an unmanaged way, that is a, you know, as as you are um, coming to a, a different location, say at home, say in work, say a public space, you start charging, you start assigning some percentages of people doing that. And, and basically it's whenever it's more, more the most convenient. So there's no aiding managing effort whatsoever. This is a function of access to charging stations, um, both publicly, but also at home. It's a function of geography, a function of seasons, of uh, different patterns of technical parameters from the batteries in the vehicle and so on. And so we are relying on public studies that approximate these charging behaviors. And that you know that for this uh, a brief mention of, of the piece of work that I'm presenting, uh, we're focusing on the ERCOT grid in Texas. Now this is the unmanaged charging, again, when it's more convenient, uh, there could be another situation in which charging is managed. And so in this case, we take uh, we take a look at two extreme cases and anything in between. So these are just cumulative bounds and one in which they start charging as soon as possible, or the other one is the one in which they delay charging as much as possible. So this creates these two bounds that you see, the upper and the lower bound, depending on early charging or as late as possible that you can still have a 100% fully charged vehicle at the end of the day. And so what you see here is a gap that stays just at any point in time, at any hour, you can find yourself or the grid can find itself in any range of electricity consumption levels. So what we do is we run these load patterns into a capacity expansion model that helps us optimize the grid in a long-term way and let us know at the least cost, what are the different pathways that we can um, uh, adopt to meet electricity demand. And what we find in these studies is that to no one's surprise, EVs will increase electricity consumption. 
So this is a graph showing the generation needs by 2050 when you have no EVs. So this is showing that the composition that is providing the electricity comes from different sources. And this is again, the Texas ERCOT grid. As we start contemplating EVs and uh, a, a modest EV penetration, and depending on the way you manage or unmanage, uh, have either unmanaged or unmanaged a scenario for charging, uh, you have slightly different compositions on the use of different resources. Um, and the trend continues as you have a full fleet of light duty vehicles that are uh, transitioning to uh, be electric, then the trend of higher electricity consumption is as expected um, following that pattern. Now, when we unpack things a bit further, we start to understand the impact of charging and how it brings other technology to the mix. And as I mentioned, uh, for example, managed charging in this case brings more solar generation to the mix or it just couples better. What I'm showing here is a dispatch graph. The previous image, it was just the total. I'm now I'm packing it in the timely resolve. So what you see here is the peak and median days for the entire year of 2050 and just how different sources are coming together to meet demand at any point in time. So this is just the curve of demand for the entire year in 2015 Texas. This is with no, no EVs and below is uh, once you have a complete electrification that is 100% of the light duty vehicles are electrified. And in this case, whenever it's more, most convenient, so the unmanaged charging scenario. So what I, I want to highlight from this is, as just expected, you know, the EVs tend to increase the uh, magnitude, but also the shape of the peaks. And in some situations, we see that uh, EVs are also playing well with storage. So that's another technology that is up and coming. So the more EVs we're seeing, the more interaction there is and opportunities to have a relation with storage in this mix. Um, continuing with the impacts on the grid, one thing that is typically uh, aimed at is reducing the peak load. And you might have heard about this uh, depending on or, uh, your background. I know this is a broad audience that not necessarily um, has dived into this topic, but uh, the importance of having a reduction of peak load is because if at any point in time, this is the amount of electricity that you require uh, or that you're being demanded and you're deploying your different generators to meet that demand, but then you have additional demand, that means that you need a bigger pool of generators or assets, hands, to cover that additional peak, additional demand. You need to size your entire system to meet that, uh, that high peak. And so that means uh, higher investments are required to meet that demand at that point. And so the goal is, in many cases, to reduce that. And so as we're starting to see that, um, we see that peaks can be shifted, just as mentioned before, depending on you know, the, how the, charge, the charging strategy goes. And so this lets us to uh, give us the pause to uh, analyze different scenarios that can help the grid operators reduce that peak, reduce the amount of market signals that tell, hey, we need investments in generators. Hence, that, that leads to a lower total system cost, which in consequence leads to a cheaper and more affordable electricity, addressing a social justice components in the process. Uh, I should say this also impacts transmission, which as you can see here, there's an increase from no electric vehicles. What you see on the x-axis is just the scenario. The y-axis is the amount of transmission capacity that is required. So those cables connect in different locations to share electricity. And so as you start bringing more uh, from modest or medium EV penetration to a full, there's a, also an increase in transmission requirements. However, it's important to know that uh, this, in any case, this is the least cost pathway. So even though there might be much, much more tr transmission shown here, this is even cheaper than just bringing more generators. And so it's an important piece. And the topic of transmission is one that has been, in fact, recognized and it's being actively addressed by the Biden administration, which, as you can see from this screenshot on the left, uh, a very uh, recent article as well, that you know there are current efforts to ramp up the energy transmission infrastructure in the country. 
Now, lastly, in terms of emissions, we noticed that as the grid evolves into 2050, it has a tendency to lead to higher CO2 emissions, mostly because of the evolution of the grid and higher loads. But interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, depending on the scenarios and how we have either a managed or a managed strategy, we can see that the total emissions per kilowatt hour, that is, yes, you're going to have more electricity demand, but for, for every kilowatt hour or for every electron, it's going to be a cleaner in comparison to having no EVs in this case. So this is an encouraging trend that we're seeing. Uh, which is a coupling of a higher share of renewables that we expect to see in the future. And again, it's an important piece of the discussion because there is a need to both address the tailpipe emissions brought directly through the EVs, but also think about the grid, where they're connecting. And it has to have a very a low carbon component as well. Hence, this is a, a, an important aspect to, to take a look at. Now, all of these concerns uh, to the grid are, of course, not unique to the U.S. In fact, we're exploring similar impacts to Mexico's grid by evaluating the major cities, as you can see in this graph, just we're all trying to understand their consumption profiles, looking at different growth projections. No one knows how many EVs will be there by you know a, a given year. There are different agencies that report different numbers, and so we're trying to map that. Um, and of course, this changed by the year, as you might know and expect, perhaps, this is a very dynamic environment. And so a, what we're trying to take a look at is look at these projections and then understand what are the impacts on an hourly basis to the grid. So this is depending on the color code or the, the projection, you know, the amount of electricity might be higher. And not only that, because that, uh, of course, will tell us that it, there's an impact and need to address it on the grid, but exactly how to address those challenges, that's the important piece. And we're modeling different policies. Okay, what happens if we have a policy, say, uh, such as demand response enacted? Would that help reduce the peak load? Uh, would that help us reduce and manage and shift? Um, what about smart charging? You know, there's a lot of discussion about smart charging, uh, charging when it's uh, most cost effective for an individual, or also monetize the benefits to the grid. So we're trying to understand those implications as well. What happens if there's a breadth of different policies enacted? You know, how better can we be if we have that in place? And what we see is that we can actually have a lower uh, amount of, uh, uh, in the profile, much, much lower peak at many points in time, or when it's important, if we are, uh, strategic about it. And so with this, uh, some of the key takeaways is that the EV deployment growth will impact the power sector, you know, the demand, the investments, um, and the, the way that we charge is uh, super important to modulate the impact. It has great potential to swing things in one way or the other. And as iterated before, it's not only important to have EVs deployed, but also take a closer look at the grid. So this is a very important coupling that must be studied holistically just as before the city level. Now we're looking at a regional level, but it's you know the same ethos. And to avoid inequities as we think about and reflect it from the work that we're uh, intending to continue push forward, um, you know, this calls for integrated grid planning. Uh, because we not only need to reduce the emissions, but also as we're thinking about emissions, those are real generation plans. And we need to take a closer look at where they're being deployed, but also evaluate where we can accelerate their decommissioning because those plants are generating pollutants and those pollutants travel, you know, influenced by air patterns. So we can couple things together very comprehensively and understand if we start deploying so many EVs across this region, this might be the opportunities to de uh, decommission these generation plants. And so that has a very, very double impact on the community. So it gives an opportunity to avoid inequities that are perhaps not immediately seen when we think about vehicles because it follows all the way up to the generation plan. And I think that's an important reflection here to, to take away from this type of work. Now, Another critical infrastructure aside from the grid is that of EV charging stations, which is needed if you want to provide access to points of recharge for those who adopt EVs. And so in the past, we've leveraged our efforts uh, coupling spots where we have high traffic congestion as shown by Waze, um, but also uh, the locations where people tend to check in 
as it's shown by popular times. And I'm sure everyone who has used Google Maps in the past has seen, you know, the uh, famous legend as busy as it gets when you're trying to go somewhere. It just gives you a normalized histogram. So coupling these two, we posit that the places where there's high traffic congestion, but also people checking in, that might be a place be uh, that people are heading to and hence need a parking spot, right? And based on that first analysis, we conduct a, a an assessment for the greater Mexico City region again, and we see, or we start selecting, you know, the spots where more people are checking in, it gets busier, but it's also high traffic congestion, you know, so we're, they're driving there. So this would be prime spots to start thinking about EV charging stations if we're thinking about electrified transportation future. However, this omits the social piece and the environmental justice discussion, we, which we want to highlight. So it's a great data exercise, but it just gets us thus, you know, so far. So to address this environmental justice piece that it's very important, we embark on its application to reveal um, those EJ issues applied in the transportation sector and do this in a city that sits right at the border of the U.S. and Mexico, and which is actually very polluted. So let me take you to this border, California and California, specifically to Mexicali. So this border city of Mexicali, just as you can see in this uh, news, news article, uh, it can top Mexico City in terms of pollution. And so in this case, uh, we try to focus in this location to try to understand, okay, can we apply environmental justice in the transportation sector planning process? And before we launch into that, just a bit more of Mexicali, for those of you who follow the transportation uh, piece uh, more uh, in depth, you know, the climate data, it's pretty hot, as you can imagine, Southwest uh, US or Northwest uh, Mexico. Uh, and, but importantly, you know, it's a, here in Mexicali, it's uh, located at a junction of major interstates and federal highways. And as stated, you know, if you go to Wikipedia, it's a very complex place. So it's a prime place. Now it's polluted, but transportation-wise, it's very complex. And so to understand and uh, evaluate the EJ component on, on this case, we, uh, we take a look and inspiration at the border state of California. So in this case, California uses an EJ mapping tool, which uh, is called the Cal and Virus screen. And what you see here is a categorization of all the census tracts in the state. And they go from low burden, which is green, to high burden or high score, which is red. And so this tool is actually uh, commonly used to disperse hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to address environmental justice issues in the state. So we take inspiration for that, but we want to do besides homogenizing discussions between countries and states in this case, that we posit, can we bring this down to a city level? Furthermore, can we prune the variables that are not transportation related and focus specifically on transportation? So to do that, what we do is basically we collect the same pattern uh, of the same, we conduct the same process and collect a breadth of data that it's similar in nature. And what you see here is the city of Mexicali and so we take a look at PM 2.5, the same particles that I told you before for um, health-related implications. We take a look at PM 10, at ozone. We also leverage on the traffic data that we uh, have partnership with Waze to understand uh, traffic congestion. So all of this gives us a good sense about the pollution. Now, we can also take a, take a look at population. So in this case, we take a look at the variables related to asthma, indigenous language, which is a proxy for discrimination, limited physical mobility. We also evaluate the distribution of vulnerable population. In this case, it's anyone below six being children and everyone above or anyone above 65, the elder, total population, and then marginalized, which is including access to education, public sanitation services, healthcare, running water, and so on. So from this pollution and population um, indices, we can create one aggregated index. What you see here is a pollution and population index. And we bring this all together, together weighted equally to have our final EJ index for the transportation sector in a city. So this is our final index for the city. 
And the idea here is to start evaluating public transportation uh, policies under this lens. So starting from different indicators that would raise those vulnerabilities to the top to then start thinking about the infrastructure deployment. I should say that we have done a similar study for Mexico City. And when we pair that with the number of EV charging stations that have been deployed so far, what we see here is that the low EJ burden uh, census tracts in the city tend to have a higher amount of EV charging stations compared to those that have a worse score in terms of this EJ transportation index out. So it's just a good early warning, if you will, that we can do much better, and it gives us a tool to understand this process and plan equitably. Now, I was in Mexicali just a second ago. Let me bring you here to Austin, because here the need for EV charging stations is important as well, uh, and to this you know, equitable planning. As a matter of fact, you know, you, I'm showing here a screenshot just a couple of months ago. This is a council city council meeting where one of the aspects to discuss was the a plan to increase the number of DC fast charging stations for EVs equitably throughout the city. So it's important to know that this is now happening as a clear example here in Austin, but I'm sure uh, the audience will have examples across many cities in which they are. Um, and of course, another question that comes is, well, why should we start thinking about EV charging stations in places where they might not have EVs? And it's important to also highlight some interesting studies that have been uh, published in which they, you know, bring a dimension of the benefits of having EV charging stations. So in this case, what they construct is a hedonic model to see the uh, benefits, in this case for residents, and the home, value, uh, 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 home valuation tends to increase. Uh, they also see a decrease in pollution and also higher access to the businesses in the area. So it's important to know that, again, or to reiterate that it's this planning process of each charging station should be considerable, should be done in an equitable way to bring everyone at the same uh, point, but also provide these opportunities that are often missed in the discussion. So what we're doing is, uh, as just a quick snapshot of our work, we're trying to understand and summarize the location of where these EV charging stations are. Here in Austin, this is an image for Austin. As you can see, x-axis, the counts of EV charging stations, EVCS, y-axis, the categories. Um, and then lastly here, you know, trying to aggregate different parameters from the city, uh, de demographic and socioeconomic indicators, just to understand and provide that first layer of information to those who are planning and having this council meeting discussions. So uh, a few a key takeaway as we thinking about an increase in EV deployment, we also need to think about this important piece of EV charging stages as a critical infrastructure. And these benefits, they can be spread equitably by reflecting those communities that are hosting them. And we have to do that early in the process of the, uh, early in the planning process. So let me briefly talk about, okay, all of this have been personal owned vehicles, light duty vehicles, but there's more to that. Right? Uh, many of us also take the bus when possible. And so uh, the question here is how can we reflect these issues also in a public transportation manner? So what we've done here, let me go back again um, to the city of Mexicali. What you see here is all the bus routes in Mexicali. We, we couple them or we overlay them, I'm sorry, with the environmental justice and transportation index to select the ones that are covering the highest burden communities. So from this, this is what it looks like. Basically, on the x-axis is just the segment is normal. Uh, on the x-axis is the EJ index, which is also color-coded. So the worst tends to be red. The green is the best, following the same color coding of the Cal and Bioscreen tool. And the y-axis is the fraction of the bus route that is covered, uh, uh, that is that's being covered for that area. And so we select the bus routes that tend to cover the most burden areas and select them as a priority to further studies. And what I mean further studies is help them understand the power or the needs that might need to be met in order for them, for those buses to be transformed from diesel-based to electric-based. So we identify four main bus routes, and this was a very extensive collaboration with the city, with different buses, bus concessionaires. But after identifying this, we partner with a uh, colleagues from Logios to start collecting data. So we mount cell phone sensors in the buses and we collect 
a, not a set of different data points. So we look at how they're driving, you know, the maximum speed, how they accelerate, how they stop, the time that they're being idle, and so on and so forth. And after that, we can construct different driving patterns. So using that, we then model, okay, if this is how they drive a diesel-based a bus right now, let's keep everything the same, but now let's transform the engine and now it's an electric bus. What, what are the uh, implications in terms of energy consumption? So let me give you a, uh, a summary of our results for the different bus routes. So this is bus route number one. You see two graphs in blue is just the baseline uh, uh, energy consumption cumulative over uh, the distance on X axis and Y axis is energy. And once you start turning the AC on and having added passengers, this would be your total cumulative uh, amount of energy consumption throughout the day. What you see here below is something that mimics the driving pattern to complete one full circuit. So that bus route, it, it starts at a given location, complete, and goes around, picks people, drops them up, and comes back to the same location, right? So that full cycle would go from green to green, and another cycle, green to green, and so on, until it finishes the day on this depot, which is signaled by the red dot. So from the depot to the beginning of the route, and then another cycle on the route, another, and so on and so forth. You see three, three lines. One is in blue, another one in gray. This is just the state of charge of the battery in the bus. One when it's recently purchased, like a new one, and one in gray, which is nearing the end of its lifetime. So just give you a sense of the amount of electricity that bus can withhold. In here, there's a critical threshold that it's advised not to go below, which is the state of charge of about 15% or, or so. And this just shows us that for this bus route, you can go from the depot fully charged, arrive to the start of your bus route, charge in there, have a charging station, and then continue, conclude one cycle, and then charge again, and then repeat the process. And for the most part, you would be able to uh, complete it. However, there might be situations, even if it's very new, as shown in blue, you might have situations where you might be in danger, dangerous territory. You wouldn't be able to complete a cycle if you were with a bus that it's all, already slightly old. And so this gives you a sense of the potential to electrify, but also the challenges. So this example, we repeated across all the bus routes. You can see again, you know, as you complete one cycle, you already cross the threshold that you shouldn't cross. You charge, and then you cannot complete one full cycle again without depleting before your battery. So this, in this bus route, we can understand that this charging process is um, it's, it's not advisable. It's it's really not uh, possible to to do it uh, successfully. We go to a smaller route, and we see this is possible. You were always above the state of charge, and we can complete multiple routes multiple cycles without any danger of crossing this state of charge. And lastly, we find, again, similar territory that sometimes you can, sometimes you can't in this final bus route. Now, put differently, what happens if you charge at the beginning of the day and you just go, 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 go until you can go no more? So ideally, you can go from red to red, so which is the depot early in the morning and once you complete your daily traveling. But if you see, maybe in bus route number three, you can do that. But uh, it's it's very questionable. So all to say that with this uh, example, it just show you how we started from the environmental justice piece to then construct very detailed scenarios and the technical capabilities of electrifying a bus route. Um, more specifically to this study, we see that opportunity charging, which is that zigzagging process, uh, brings the most promise just because in many of the cases you can charge and then complete the cycle and then charge again and be able to fulfill that. However, this calls to question and more studies, of course, on how to go about these charging strategies, which is the call, the type of discussions that are being held with the cities, you know, how to redesign basically the bus roads. Um, lastly, there are many characteristics that come into play, but the key takeaways here is that public transportation is, uh, provides mobility to many, so it's not only private vehicles, and therefore it must be also analyzed in greater uh, depth for the electrification piece. Um, and it, studies are required, you know, to understand how can we can rapidly convert this uh, electrification process or push it forward. And uh, what I would say in terms of, you know, the lens to avoid inequities and what we're thinking uh, from our lab's perspective is that 
the public, you know, having a clean public transportation uh, can be pursued if we start thinking about these EJPs early on, which is kind of what we're pushing for before launching into very detailed studies and then looking at the community afterwards, we're trying to flip things around. So just let me conclude with one final piece that it's beyond because I talk about transportation electrification, but we also have to reflect that to access that, you know, sometimes we need uh, not to go, rely on vehicles. So uh, walkability is another mode of transportation, which should be part of the discussion about transportation as a whole. And so moving beyond vehicles, you know, we try to look at the, uh, the quality of sidewalks for dignified walkability. So we construct in this case a walkability index that takes into consideration different obstacles. You know, how good can you travel uh, safely, you know, in the sidewalk before getting to a bus spot to begin with, right? That's like disconnection between your, ho your home and accessing this point for pickup for a bus. You know, you can think about that. Extending the access for public transportation through walkability. And so in this case, our analysis shows that in the city, most of it is in poor walkability conditions. And so, in fact, if we start to quantify the, the spread of this distribution is towards the left, meaning about 60% of the sidewalks we evaluated, um, which was more than 500 kilometers, were in the poor condition. So let me give you an idea of what poor and good looks like. In this case, this is an appropriate design for sidewalks. You have plenty of space in between to reach to the, the street, but you can also have, if we take a virtual walk, horizontal obstacles just impeding, a, you know, moving from one piece to another in a safe way. So this is just horizontal obstacles and vertical obstacles as well. Uh, but perhaps there is, you know, they say a, a picture can tell more than a thousand words. You know, there's this case where you can also see a situation where clearly, clearly vulnerable population are not having dignified walking conditions and just having no sidewalk whatsoever, which is here cemented in Google Street View images um, for this study. So the key takeaways is walking is mobility as well and should be considered also holistically in transportation related discussions. And it's not, it's not guaranteed, especially when we start thinking about different contexts at different places in the world. And so this is a serious burden when we think about equity. It's not only equity in our city, it's equity everywhere, right? And so to avoid inequities, you know, uh, the lens that we're taking for this, for this uh, topic is that we need to start uh, looking into an integrated approach, just as said before, for urban transportation that considers walkability. And when we're planning about transportation, uh, public transportation services, uh, this can be also an enabler for people to reach to public transportation in the first place. So let me conclude um, by just highlighting three points that transportation electrification brings many benefits and as discussed has also impacts and challenges as we start to relate that to different infrastructures. So these inequities, they need to be sought conceive and address early on in the process, especially as we're thinking about this decarbonization process that it's part of our energy transition, reflecting transportation, um, because at the end of the day, we want to bring this well-being, health, and economic benefits to everyone. And I just show that, you know, some tools and approaches can help in these discussions, both here in the U.S., but else, elsewhere to start thinking and uh, having a meaningful, rapid, and equitable climate action approach. So with that, I'll conclude. I'm always more than happy to explore collaborations and I would welcome any questions that you might have either right now or uh, later on if you can shoot me an email, happy to engage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sergio. This is um, such a like an incredible amount of work that you all have done here and it's really exciting to be able to um, share this with everyone. Um, so we have a couple questions coming in already, and I urge everyone to um, submit your additional questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, I'll start with maybe an easier one before I dive into another question that um, I think is going to be a little more complicated. Um, John asks, who is manufacturing charging stations and, and EV buses? Are, are, is that happening in the United States or is this happening elsewhere? Yeah, I would say by far the leaders are in China, and I think that's no uh, surprise. But this administration has been uh, very bully on supporting uh, U.S. manufacturing, and so I was just uh, watching a couple of days ago, you know, manufacturing the U.S. from August 
last year uh, and to date, the the announcements being made just like you know a hockey uh, stick curve essentially. So it's it's on the rise, and I think we should expect more to happen. Um, there are companies in California that are looking at um, buses specifically, and so uh, and more are coming. Actually, they're launching into this uh, uh, into this space as well. But I think still we're lacking or we're behind some other countries, but I, I would expect this to be changing pretty soon. Okay. Um, here's the perhaps more complicated question from Colby, um, who wrote that EVs tend to be a few hundred pounds heavier than traditional uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, causing more wear and tear on the pavement and thus increased infrastructure expenditures which can therefore disproportionately affect overburdened communities. So the question is, how might this revenue be recovered in an equitable way, especially considering that gas tax and potentially lottery tax, and if, if you could explain what that is to people, that would be helpful, would be affected as gas stations are phased out? That's an interesting question. Um... Yeah, how can these investments be redirected? Well, I think, you know, once taking a step back, I think this redisbursement, it's an interesting approach. Taking again the example that I gave from Cal Bio Screen, which they try to rank census tracts, I think there's opportunity to have this more granular. And this addresses the piece of how do you reinvest that that money? I don't think there is a one answer to how to reinvest. And in fact, many of the discussions are trying to pay attention to what the communities might want to see. And so I'm not sure there would be like a general answer to that, but mostly like a tailored, you know, neighborhood level, perhaps, uh, in terms of what the investment might look like. But it's, it's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, I... I'll, I'll I'll stick with that only because yeah, as agreed, it, it's a very co complex question. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, this is this is as written more of a comment than a question, but I think we can turn it into a, a question for you to respond to. Um, James said that you know from an equity perspective, according to the Civil Rights Project at Harvard, um, twenty four percent of African American. 17% of Latino and 13% of Asian American households do not own a car. Um, here in Rhode Island, for example, James goes on to say 11% um, of Rhode Island households have no car. Um, and that that doubles within the city of Providence. So the, the final comment there was a complete EV electrification doesn't address core equity issues. And I wonder how you would mm. respond to that. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, James, because that, that is true. And you'll see there's a lot of discussion. In fact, uh, a big movement of, you know, a, a world without cars, essentially. Do we need cars? Because what we really need is mobility, right? Or access to. I'll tell you, there, there's some articles that show that having means of transportation can improve, can also lead to a social mobility. So I think there's an argument to be made against having vehicles as it stands. But if you dig deeper, is it is it really the vehicle itself or having access to that service? And I think that calls the question about reorganizing the way we interact and reorganizing cities. And you think about that, that's basically the goal, right? We don't uh, we don't need the car per se, but we just need the outcome that that provides. And so I, I think you're completely right. And it's perhaps like a two sets of time resolutions. One is acting right now with what we have. Can we convert? But at the same time, we should be rethinking you know, our cities. And can we go without cars at all? Can we have accessibility in our neighborhoods? Can we just use bikes to get from point A to point B? And if that's the case, I'm 100% in agreement. So I think both angles, just from the realistic perspective right now, but also from where we want to be are, are, are right. And, and the next question actually builds on that directly. Tina asked if you thought transportation changes should be implemented equally, meaning putting charging stations in all places, or should mobility solutions be tailored to the needs of specific communities? So for example, would improving walkability in urban areas, um, instead of building charging stations, inadvertently, or maybe purposefully, decrease the purchase of EVs? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I, I well, I agree. It's it's similar to the pre or it builds on on the previous response because it's it's both those two time dimensions. But I also think I think you know just as I showed, there's this new article that came earlier this year that talks about the impact of recharging stations, like quantifying that. And I think it's still early to say. Personally, yeah, there might be some counters that we're not conceiving right now of having massively deployment of that. Um, so I, I wouldn't know what are the cons against it, but I do believe in that um, opportunity to have tailored solutions and looking at the end goal, what exactly are we aiming for as society? And so that would definitely call for having, you know, perhaps not even that need to have a, this type of personal vehicles in the first place. So it's interesting. I, I, I appreciate that because it's a very thoughtful comment as well. Well, and um, again, there, we're we're hitting on a very common theme here. So, so Ed, um, taking this yet a step further, Ed asks, "What are our next action steps then to make sure that public transportation goes mm -hmm. green faster?" Um, and I, this is obviously this is there's a lot there, and this is also very locally specific, I would imagine. But right. anything that you can respond to that would be useful. Well, I can only speak for my experiences because it's definitely, a, it can vary, you know, and that's what I've learned the process. You know, we've, some of the examples that I've shown for Mexicali, we've also done them for uh, Oakland, California. And so in the process, we've learned that even those, let's say a bus route is operating within the city, it's not in their jurisdiction to do anything about it. So they don't own basically uh, the, the buses and they cannot uh, do, do much essentially. Whereas in Mexicali, it was everything within it, and they had the jurisdiction to implement some policies and whatnot. So same physical um, overlapping, if you will, of bus routes in the city. And you would think that the uh, governance would be similar. It's not. And so I say this all to, to reflect that, at least for us, it was an understanding of the complexity um, of, of doing this. And even when we had it, all the stakeholders Speaking about that example in Mexicali, even when we had all the stakeholders in the, the in the room and were able to have some conversations, you know, those things take time, and sometimes they're looking for alternatives that are cheaper. Their bottom line at the end is not help the environment. Sad, sad to say, but for the most part, you know, as a bus concessioner, you know, they, they, their job is to make a living and have some profits. Especially with COVID, you know, things ridership decay like thirty percent, seventy percent. And so it's really hard right now to, to own a bus. And so for them, it's, okay, what's the cheaper fuel? And in many cases, electricity is not the first one. So it's a numbers game. And so if we can demonstrate, you know, that this is a tech, this is a economically feasible, I think that's the big first step. Because then once that is in there, you know, it becomes pretty, uh, 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 like a uh, automated process. I'm not going to say that trivially, but, you know, and it's true for any technology, I should say, but. Um, but anyway, I, I think all to say that uh, financing, the financing and the, the the dollars, you know, how expensive it is, plays a big role. And so that uh, if we can collectively somehow uh, put our brains to that, I think they would go a long way. Great. Um, well, I have one last question for you uh, before before we adjourn. And that is, um, I just, I think that the the EJ index that you created is just so incredible because you've just pulled so much information together and this is such a rich tool. And so I wonder, um, are you getting interest from, from anyone in, in, in really applying this yet? Or have you not even kind of gotten that far? No, yeah, absolutely. So in the city of Mexicali, you know, we definitely kept the conversations going and this was super useful for them. Also for other researchers, you know, looking into this, even I'll say, I find it, you know, I mimic, I got inspiration from California because it's an exercise they did and they used to disburse hundreds of millions of dollars. Like it, it is a policy instrument. And so I think just by uh, emulating that, we're reflecting on something that has been backed up with dollars. And I don't think there's a, a better seal of approval. Uh, so for sure. Now I'll say a lot of this was a, very data driven, but what we're trying to do now is complement that and give the reality check with community. So, uh, has been community inspired, but we want to now, uh, because we started from that dimension, we want to bring it to the community and, and see just reality check and where where it matches and where it doesn't. And so, I think 
uh, that's definitely our ongoing work and part of the things that our students are working on. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sergio Castellanos. Um, we'd love to hear about all of your great work. And um, as a reminder to everyone, uh, you can still register for the rest of the lectures this month by visiting metcalfinstitute.org. Um, Phoebe had shared a link in the chat earlier. And of course, as I noted before, if you're inspired by these talks and want to support more of Metcalf Institute's work, we hope you'll make a gift today and get the extra thrill of knowing that your gift will be matched 100%. Um, so let's see, we look forward to seeing you next week for, that would be Thursday, June 15th. Please note that that lecture will be held at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we'll feature Dr. Emily Grubert from the University of Notre Dame, who will talk about challenges and opportunities presented by the clean energy transition, um, and specifically the social, economic, and political factors that influence the progress of this effort. With that, I thank you all so much for joining us today, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon.